Hello, everyone. Welcome to another session. I'm super excited that everyone's here. I hope you're all having a great week. We are excited for this seminar. We hope it's going to be a blessing and absolutely super excited. Um, Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for this meeting that you're enabling us to attend, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we know that you know every single person's heart, Lord Jesus. Everyone that's attending, Lord, you know what they're thinking, Lord, and what they're feeling, Jesus. And Lord, we know, Lord, that you're going to be using the speaker today, Jesus, that we may hear what we need to hear, Jesus, and that we may learn something new about you, Lord Jesus, who you are, Lord, and the word, Jesus. Lord, strengthen us today, Jesus, and ready our hearts, Lord, that we may be able to understand what is being heard, Jesus, and that we may use that, Lord Jesus, in our lives, Lord Jesus. But I ask you in your name to bless every person that's listening, Jesus, to bless the speaker, Lord, and the people that arrange this meeting, Lord Jesus. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, Lord, during this quarantine time, Lord Jesus. What you're doing, Lord Jesus, when the whole world is panicking, Lord Jesus. You are the one that's keeping us together and giving us strength to keep going, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I give you thanks, Lord, and I praise you, Lord, for all the things that you're doing, Jesus, that will glorify your name, Lord. Lord, before this meeting ends, Jesus, help all of us to have changed in some kind of way, Lord that our thinking in some kind of, in one area would have changed Jesus. And Lord, I believe, Lord, that through this meeting, we'll all be one step closer to you, Jesus. And Lord, we thank you that this meeting will glorify your name, Jesus, that this meeting will be something that will help us all to grow spiritually, Lord Jesus. Lord, open our eyes and our hearts, Lord, and enlighten us, thank Jesus, you, because we want to press on to know you better, Jesus. And Lord, we thank you once again for all your praise, Lord. Of bringing us together, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Now, I guess we can start from our inductive Bible study from Jude. So I invite Pastor Philip Eben. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, ICP of UK, for setting up this meeting and this Bible study and for your invitation. Uh, I'm really glad to be here with you on this platform. Uh, I would like to welcome all of you uh, to this inductive study of the Epistle of Jude. And I encourage uh, people to use the inductive method of Bible study. And in case you are new to this method, I shall explain the nature of this method and how you go about doing inductive Bible study. Now, there is a workbook that I have prepared for you uh, and uh, you will be uh, you know provided a link to this workbook uh, I, I guess the link will be provided later or else I could provide it here for you uh, it's a it's a PDF file that you can download and uh, here we have the text of the epistle of Jude and uh, you have the introductory notes on Bible study, uh, detailed instructions as to how to go about doing this Bible study, and there are tables and forms to be printed out. And uh, that, that's the address here, the web, the web link to access uh, the workbook. I guess that will be provided to you at a later stage as well. Uh, when it comes to inductive Bible study, well, I, I have used this picture before as well in one of your meetings. I've said that a lot of people are like hens. They, they like to uh, do a little bit of scratching on the surface and they are comfortable. Uh, they find a good spot and they lie down and they're happy with spiritual fast food, things which you get in a minute or two. And as a hen, scratches the ground it finds a few worms here and there and that's it a lot of christians are satisfied you know uh, with the these kind of worms that they get i'm not saying uh, the spiritual i'm referring to spiritual fast food which may not actually represent god's voice from uh, the bible at the same time 
There are others who go deeper into the earth. They are miners and they find gold and other precious uh, you know, metals and uh, uh, precious stones and minerals. Uh, I want the church of Jesus Christ to go deeper into God's word. And when you go deeper into God's word, you begin to see what God has actually kept there for us. Uh, the, the, the spiritual food that he has prepared for us and how we can grow and produce fruit for the sake of the Lord and, and his kingdom. And a lot of people, when, when they go to the Bible, uh, they are in the dark. They don't know uh, what to make of the text that they read and study. And they read the Bible year after year and they forget everything. And because of this, uh, they still remain in the dark when it comes to uh, God's message for them and for the church, their productivity, their spiritual growth, everything remains stunted and hampered. But when some, some of them, they know how to reach out to a library, to online libraries or physical books, uh, their tendency is to reach out to a commentary or to Google, or to any other resource out there to understand what the text means. Now, inductive Bible study is the opposite of this. We don't encourage people to reach out to other sources at the outset. Uh, on the other hand, we encourage uh, Bible students to examine the text, to examine the Bible itself, to find answers. Because there's so much there that we don't notice and we are too lazy to study, to read. And so we reach out to other resources. And uh, sometimes we rely on prepackaged lessons and prepackaged Bible studies. So instead of even when we come together as a group, our tendency is to buy one of those books. And they're not bad. Uh, they may be good even, but still. Uh, we don't have an inclination, a natural inclination to go and examine the text for ourselves. And even pastors, uh, I would say a lot of them, even though they are trained to study the Bible and come up with their own Bible studies, original studies, they would rather reach out to canned sermons, ready to preach formulations. And uh, and that is why many several websites are there that provide membership to pastors. They they'll not only provide sermons but also illustrations as well. So there's so many resources out there. And why would anyone take the trouble to go inductive, uh, to go and examine the text as if there was no other commentary, as if Google did not exist? Uh, the rewards are many, because. You can always go to a store and buy a diamond, but then a diamond that will be most precious to you will be a diamond that you yourself dig out from the ground. So you can always find excellent sermons and resources and Bible studies everywhere. You can find uh, Bible teaching out there on any book, any topic. But when you go and study the Bible yourself, the lessons that you learn will be remembered the most and you will treasure those lessons. Uh, so the choice is yours. You can always uh, remain a baby and demand to be fed. You can remain with a bottle or graduate to the folk, to solid food. Uh, it, it's the choice is yours. But I would encourage you to take the trouble and choose inductive method of Bible study instead of reaching out to uh, uh, formulations that are out there. Okay, now I have several videos on my uh, YouTube channel all related to Bible study. There's a playlist there, how to study the Bible. And I have seven video lessons uploaded there, uh, such as why study the Bible? Why not just read? You know, there are so many people who ask me, why should we even study the Bible? The Holy Spirit is there to help us and he's there to, you know, speak to us uh, very well. What's the need to study? 
uh, you should watch that uh, lesson. And again, another question, which version should I use? There are several versions. Which version of the Bible should I use? Number three, are all 66 books of the Bible sacred and authoritative for us? Uh, and I know there are people out there who say, you know, that's in the Old Testament. Please focus on the New Testament. And there are other folks who say, and even in the New Testament, let's forget the Gospels. Let's focus on Acts of the Apostles and the Epistles. What about us? Should we take the whole Bible seriously? And then what's the deductive method? I spoke about the inductive method. Now, unless you know what deductive method is, you may not appreciate what inductive method is all about. I encourage you to watch that uh, in these lessons. And even if you don't watch any other uh, video lesson out there, I would like you to uh, watch the sixth one, how to make sentence diagrams. What are sentence diagrams? I'll come to all these a little later. How to discover the structure of a text. And I deal especially with reverse symmetry. And you see, we are just focusing on the fifth one here, inductive study method. And that is to highlight the importance of all these video lessons. I don't have to mention everything that's mentioned there over here now because we don't have the time for that. And you can take a screenshot or, um, you know, using a phone, you can take the picture of the QR code uh, that's given there and go to my site, uh, the channel, the playlist. Now, on to the method of uh, inductive Bible study. Uh, there are three major steps in inductive Bible study. Number one, observation. Uh, number two, interpretation. Number three, application. Now, uh, observation uh, deals with what the text says. You keep asking yourself, what does the text say? There's a lot to observe in God's word. And I can assure you, that you will, if when you start studying the Bible in depth, you will notice things that you have never noticed until then. And a lot of Christians gloss over the text. You know, we just read chapter after chapter, book after book, and year after year, we might read the Bible at least once or many times. But then we don't stop and re-examine the Bible to actually see what the text says. And I'm sad to say that there are Christians who don't want to be shown what is in the text. They would rather believe what their church or their pastor or their favorite uh, leaders believe and teach. And they do not even want to be shown uh, what the Bible actually says. Uh, we think we are very good at reading between the lines, but then we don't know how to read the lines and we miss out a lot. So it's very important to observe what the text says. Number two, what did the text mean? Now, I'm not asking here, what does the text mean? I'm asking, what did the text mean? Our intention is to know what Jude, the epistle of Jude, meant to the, the author and the original readers. Uh, it is important to know that because a number of Christians, they look into their Bibles as if it's their smartphone. They're checking for a message from God. And they say, oh, I got a verse from the Bible. And it's quite comforting. And God says, stay calm. I have a great plan for your life. And they think it's a direct message from God to them. Yes, indeed, sometimes God does speak to people like that. I don't deny that. But that's not the way God speaks uh, most of the time. And when we get a promise card from our churches, that's the same kind of joy we have or to get a wonderful promise at the beginning of the year. Uh, but we don't care whether it was written uh, in a particular context uh, addressing a totally different scene. And, and we know the story of, of the person who opened the Bible and he put his finger on, a, on some words. He opened his eyes and he read, you know, Judas went and hanged himself. Oh, he thought that's, a, that's really not a good verse to be read early in the morning. He closed the Bible, repeated the exercise, and he got another verse. And you know the story. Uh, it goes like this. You too go and do likewise. He was shocked. He had to repeat it uh, another time. And then it said, uh, what you are to do, do it quickly. 
So that, that's what happens when we read the Bible totally out of context. When we don't understand that the word of God, even though it has eternal relevance for the whole of humanity, each book of the Bible was written at a particular time by a particular person addressing a particular set of people or an individual or a church or a group of churches. So you can place each book on the timeline uh, in a particular context. And this is what we call the situatedness of each book. And we have to understand each book in its context, understand what the book meant at that time, and then move on to the third step application. What does the text mean for us today? If we don't understand what the text meant at that time, we will not be able to apply it in our lives today. And if, you, and if you know that God spoke in a certain way to a certain person in a certain circumstance, you can be sure that God will give the same message to you as you go through a similar situation. So we have the three steps here, observation, interpretation, application. If you observed correctly, chances are that you will interpret correctly. And if you interpret it correctly, chances are that you will apply the scripture in your life correctly. The goal of all Bible study is proper application in our lives. Obedience should be our goal. We are not studying these things to show that we have discovered something from the Bible. It's actually to obey God's word. It's to be fruitful in God's eyes. And that's what matters. Otherwise, we just end up as knowledgeable sinners and knowledgeable backsliders. That's not what we want because God will judge us using his word. And therefore, let us be humble as we engage in Bible study. Fearing God because the, the God who teaches us his word is the very God who will judge us one day. We have to give an account to him. And as we follow these steps, let's remember that we follow these steps in a cyclical manner. We do follow a sequential, uh, you know, the steps here. First comes observation, then comes interpretation, and then application. But then you don't have to complete all your observation before you begin application, uh, interpretation, uh, or even application. As you study the Bible, you go through several cycles of these three steps. As you see here in this diagram that I've drawn, you start with observation, move on to interpretation, and then to application, and then you go to a wider uh, area, and then again repeat observation, interpretation, application. You know, it's, it's not a, a concentric circle here. Think of it as a spiral that jumps out of the page. It's, you know, it's moving from one side to the other. At the same time, it grows in diameter. So this side, you know, you go through several iterations of these steps until you have gone, you have done this many times and you know the book through and through. So otherwise, you, you may think that, okay, let me wait till I do all of observation. Uh, only then I can actually get something out of it. No. Even at the preliminary stage, you will learn something uh, that you can you know, apply in your life. Okay, now that I've spoken about the steps in this method, I move on to the approach that we take in inductive Bible study. Uh, the approach is a book-by-book -book approach. Oftentimes, when we come together in a prayer meeting, we start with a, a random verse, we start studying that verse, and then we realize that we can't understand that verse until we understand the passage or the paragraph. And once we start studying the passage, we realize that uh, we cannot understand the passage until we understand the whole book and how that passage fits into the whole book. So that's not actually the recommended way. I mean, this is not a, 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 you know, a mistake as such. It's better to realize that you have to study the whole book in order to understand a particular verse, even at a later stage, than never to realize it at all. Then why don't we start it the, the other way? We, we should start with a book overview 
and then move on to a passage. All the major passages, you will discover the major subdivisions of the book. And then finally, at a later stage, you move on to verses and words. So I, I'll talk about this in a little while uh, as, we, as I give you detailed instructions as to how to go about the study. So when you do the inductive study, uh, uh, when you follow this method, I suggest that you take a whole book, follow the whole uh, book by book method, or if you want another independent unit of scripture, select Psalms, select one of the Psalms. So you do a book overview, and then you move on to the study of larger subdivisions, and then smaller passages, and finally to sentences and words. There's no point arguing about verses and words until you have taken this top-down approach. Okay, now uh, it's time to move into some action. Now, action by which I mean uh, actions that you will engage in, not what I'm going to demonstrate. Uh, and all of that is in the workbook. And this talk is actually an introduction to invite you to download the workbook and then uh, get yourself going. And I should say that a number of you might be disappointed by now because usually when you are invited to a Bible study, this is what you expect. You expect a pre-formulated uh, formula. You know, uh, well, let me just sit back and enjoy. Let me just receive something from the Lord. Now, this session is not meant for that. This is not what I'm going to do. So when I talk about the steps, it's actually steps that you should be doing. That's because I believe that if I catch a fish for someone and give it to that person, he'll have food for one day. But if I teach that person how to fish, he will have food every day, or he could have food every day if he wanted. So the first step is in any inductive Bible study is to choose your book or to choose your psalm. Now, I wouldn't want you to take up the book of Isaiah with 66 chapters or any such big book. It's because you're, you're going to do a whole book overview. I may not suggest the book of Acts for you with 28 chapters. So as a beginner in inductive study, I would rather encourage you to start with a small book. And that's why I chose uh, the book of Jude for my workshop on inductive Bible study. This is, a, this is just an introduction, an invitation, uh, so that you will start this journey from now and then carry on with it for the rest of your life. So the book of Jude is one of the smallest books in the New Testament. It has just one chapter and 25 verses in that chapter. So you can manage to read the whole book within a few minutes. And that's why I chose the book of Jude. And then you have to choose your version. And here I have to emphasize this fact that it's better to choose a literal translation. Don't go for the Living Bible or the Message translation, or not even to NIV. I would rather uh, ask you to use a literal translation like the RSV or the New American Standard Version or uh, the ESV, the English Standard Version. But in this workbook, I've given you the full text from the New American Standard Bible, 1995. So why is that? It's because uh, it is a tighter translation, more of a word for word translation. And words are very important in inductive Bible study. We give a lot of importance to words and especially words that repeat. I'll come to that in a few minutes. So choose your literal version. And suppose you are a more advanced learner and you, you compare several versions and you're not happy with uh, the New American Standard Version or you're not happy with any other version. And you find that you have to merge several versions together to formulate your own version. And you may be a person who knows Greek or Hebrew or whatever. And I encourage you to synthesize your own version or translate from the originals if you can, if you are trained to do so. 
So you have to settle your version, settle your text before you start your study. And for beginners, your text is already there. Go for New American Standard Version. Uh, I know NIV is quite popular, but then there are times when NIV makes certain decisions for you where a particular verse could mean this or that, where you should have the freedom to retain, where you should actually retain your freedom to go this way or that. NIV does not give you that option. And I don't have the time to show you uh, detailed examples, but then uh, don't allow a translator to decide for you what a particular ambiguous text should mean. Number three, uh, you have the text now, it's already there in the workbook, double spaced text with sufficient margins on both sides. So take a print out of those two pages. Uh, why do I encourage people to do this? I don't want you to do your markings and highlightings and all that on your Bible. Even if you have the NASB, you know, Precept Ministries, uh, uh, it's based in the United States and headed by Kay Arthur. She teaches a similar inductive Bible study method and she has come up with an inductive study Bible. If you have access to that, fine. But even then, I would encourage you to print out your own text uh, on sheets of paper so that you you can uh, uh, you know you can grapple with the text and uh, draw your lines color it whichever way you want use your symbols yeah more of that coming soon so have a printout of the text then the most crucial thing read the text now uh, I want you to have it as a hard copy I don't want you to go through a soft copy and then do control, you know, copy paste, search operations. No, I want you to have a hard copy of the text in your hands and I want you to read. It is said that good Bible students, they read a particular book in one sitting for as many as 25 times before they settle down to study it in depth. Read your book as many times as possible. Now, this is not about you going through the text. It's my desire, or it's a desire of every good Bible teacher uh, to see a student go through a course or go through a book. But more than that, I want you, I want the course to go through you. I want this book to go through you. And finally, at the end of the study, uh, you will understand that you are saturated with God's word. You will overflow with God's word. And that's what God's word says in Colossians chapter four. It says you have to be so saturated with God's word that you will be able to minister to others. And it is this saturation with God's word that leads to the fullness of the Holy Spirit, not the other way. Okay, so read the Bible. And one of the goals that you have while reading the Bible is to glean some information. And you need to understand uh, certain background details and that's what you mean by overview as you go through the text you want to know what the text says at the same time you would like to unearth some of these background details which are not so obvious for example as you do uh, as you read the text keep asking these questions what when who where why and how uh, as you pose these questions to the text things will start coming out for example, you want to know who wrote the book. Sometimes it's obvious, especially when you read an episode or, uh, or a gospel, such as the gospel of uh, Luke. And even in gospel of Luke, actually, it doesn't say, I, Luke, write this. But, you know, you compare it with the book of Acts and you understand. But in most of Paul's epistles, yeah, yeah, in all 13, excluding Hebrews, uh, in all 13, he says, I, Paul, and Paul starts off introducing himself and he greets the recipients. So you can know who wrote it. Sometimes it's not so obvious, uh, as in the case of the Gospel of John. Next, you want to know in what circumstance the book was, was written. What led the author to write that book? And this dating is not the regular dating we talk about. It's uh, placing the book on, a, on, on the timeline. Where would you place the book? When was it written? Sometimes it's obvious. The writer will, you know, gives you clues. 
I'm writing this uh, book, uh, you know, during the fifth year of this king, or uh, this emperor was ruling uh, for so many years now, and there was a census at this time. They talk about natural calamities or other political developments. You can place the book on the timeline. Sometimes you, you may have to ask, was this book written after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? Was it written before the fall of Jerusalem? Uh, like that, you know, you got to ask some questions and you may be able to roughly place the book on the timeline. To whom was the book addressed? In the case of epistles, sometimes it's stated to my dear son Timothy, or sometimes it is not. It's written to the whole church. Uh, in the case of Jude, I want you to read and find out, is a recipient mentioned? Jude is, unlike Ephesians or Philippians, is not known by the recipient's name, uh, it's known by the author's name. So if the recipient is not mentioned, uh, how are the recipients described? Through the description given there, you may be able to say what kind of recipients receive this letter. And the purpose, in some letters, the purpose is explicitly stated. In some other books, it's not. For example, in, in the letter to Philippians, it is, uh, not explicitly stated, but it's implicit. We know that the Philippian church sent a gift to Paul while he was in prison, and he wanted to write a thank you letter. And if you read carefully, you will know that he, he, he not only wrote it to say thank you, but there were two women who were at odds. They could not see eye to eye on many things. And it was an appeal to them to come down from their lofty purchase and then to get reconciled. And, and that's why he wrote about the humility of Jesus in chapter 2. And then finally, he names those women in chapter 4. So in the same way, why did Jude write this letter? Does he mention his central purpose explicitly? And finally, is there a theme to the whole book? Sometimes it's not very obvious. You have to wait till the whole study is over until you can formulate the theme of the book using the keywords that you discover. More about keywords in a few minutes. And as you read and gather these background uh, pieces of information, you have to record your observations on a chart called at a glance chart. Even that is provided in your workbook. So you will have to record it. You know who wrote the book, the author, the historical setting, uh, the date, the recipient, and uh, the purpose of this letter, and the overall theme. This form is given, just print it out. And the next thing is, you, as you read, keep reading. And as you read, you have to understand the structure of the book. You will notice that the book folds neatly into several sec sections. There are major divisions, subdivisions, smaller passages. And um, from one to the another, the author moves smoothly. And sometimes you notice these divisions by, by the use of certain connecting words, such as but, nevertheless, or therefore, and finally, and all those words. So as you read the book over and over again, and sometimes if you can't read, please listen. Listen to the text when you, when you drive or when you travel. And, and keep uh, focusing on the text. It's only 25 verses. So you have to trace the author's flow of thought and you keep listening to it. You will notice that there are certain repetitions also, uh, how he transitions from one section to the other. And I'll give you an example here. You have John's gospel. Here is a broad outline of John's gospel. And you notice that in the first 12 chapters, John focuses on the signs that Jesus performed. He did many miracles, those are called signs, and uh, that portion focused on the public ministry of Jesus. And therefore, that portion of John's gospel is called the book of signs. Then from chapter 13, Jesus focuses on his disciples. He speaks about the glory that he's going to receive. And John says he, he has not been glorified yet, uh, yet and um, and Jesus says, you know, Father, now is the time. Glorify your son. So 
it not only talks about Jesus's private ministry among his disciples, it also talks about his passion, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. So uh, from chapter 13 to 20, you have the book of glory. And finally, there's a tailpiece, the epilogue. And the first 18 verses of John's gospel, that's, that's also quite unique. It provides a key to the whole book and a, a good introduction. We call it the prologue to the gospel of John. So in the same way, you will be able to understand the structure of the, the epistle of Jude. And, and one thing, a tool that helps you to visually represent the, the structure of a book is uh, sentence diagrams. So it helps you to understand the main flow of thought. At the same time, it will help you to segregate the main thing from the subordinate things. There's a main message, and sometimes the author might uh, move away from that main flow of thought. He might uh, you know, deviate a bit and go after some other topic, like Paul often does, and then, you know, the author might just come back. So you should be able to say, here he goes away and then he comes back. So just like you identify a thread in a necklace, you should be able to identify the main thread and all that comes to the fore when you do a sentence diagram. It's not easy. It might take you several days to do it. Now, if you ask me how many weeks I spent on Jude, I think I spent around one or two months on the book of Jude. And even just to prepare this workbook, it took me a month. So uh, here we are. If you really want to know the importance of a sentence diagram, I, I would encourage you to ask your pastor or your Bible teacher this question, what is Ephesians 1 all about? And they'll come up with you know, an answer like this. It's about the salvation that God gave us through Jesus Christ. It's how God elevated us to the heavenly places to give us all spiritual blessings. It's about predestination. I'm sure they'll use the word predestination. And uh, what else? Uh, they'll talk about all the blessings, the blessing of the Holy Spirit, uh, how God sealed us with the Holy Spirit. But then, what is Ephesians 1 all about? You understand that when you create your sentence diagram. Look at this. This is my sentence diagram of Ephesians chapter 1. I'll just quickly take you through that. Here, it, it begins with Paul. The first word is Paul. And after writing Paul there, I use a word processor software here. And then I, you know, press the enter key and bring the rest of the sentence down. And I indent it to the right because what follows there, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, is actually a description of Paul. It tells us more about the noun Paul. And therefore, it's subordinate to Paul, so I move it to the right. And then comes to the saints. That belongs to the main flow of thought. So Paul to the saints. And now something about the saints. Now, how does he describe the saints? Who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus? So two things about the saints. So I place those two clauses under the word saints. And then he comes back to the main thing. Grace to you and peace from God the Father. And he goes on. So the most important thing there in verses 1 and 2 is Paul says to the saints, grace and peace. It's just an introduction and saying hello. So that's the most important thing. And the rest is actually subordinate. I'm not saying they're unimportant, but then they're subordinate clauses. So you identify the main thing and you focus on that to understand the main flow of thought. And then he goes on to say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he gives us reasons uh, uh, to worship God. Now, what Paul does here is not, uh, he's not preaching, he's not teaching. What he does here is worshiping. Ephesians 1 is about Paul greeting the church at Ephesus and then breaking forth into sweet worship. Paul worships God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he tells us why he worships him. You know, he has blessed us. He's chosen us. You know, he's predestined us. There again, predestination is not the most important thing. It's one of the reasons why he worships God the Father. 
And then going on further, he tells us more about Jesus. In verse 7, he talks about in him. And then he goes on to describe Jesus Christ. In verse 9, he comes back to the main theme on the left. And then he gives us more reasons. And finally, he says, you know, for this reason, at the bottom of the screen, you see, for this reason, what's he going to say there? For this reason, I give thanks to you. And then in verse 18, he says, I pray for you. So what is Ephesians 1 about? You go through the sentence diagram, you know, Paul greets Ephesians. Paul worships God the Father and tells us why he worships. Number three, Paul says that he thanks God for the Ephesians. And finally, he says, I pray for you. And this is what I pray for you. And why do I pray for you like that? It's because of these, these reasons. I pray that God will fill you with his power. And then in that box, he tells us more about the power. You see, the power thing is what Pentecostals will latch on to. But that's not the most important thing in Ephesians 1. Yes, it's important there. But in the overall scheme of things, we get to place things in, in their right place. That's what sentence diagram will do for you. So I've summarized that. If you are able to do that, very soon you will be able to discover the theme of the book. And in order to discover the theme of the book, we rely on words, phrases, and themes, especially words that repeat. If I ask you, what's 1 Corinthians chapter 13 about? You will say, that's the chapter on love. Why do you say that? It's because the word love keeps repeating over and over again in that chapter. If I ask you, what's Ephesians Sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 all about. You'll say it's about resurrection. Why? It's the theme, resurrection, that keeps repeating. The same thing about Romans chapter 8. It's the most spiritual book of the Bible because you come across the word Holy Spirit or Spirit more often than in any other chapter. In the same way, there are words that keep repeating, and that's why you need to follow a literal version. Look out for words that keep repeating. What kind of words? Since it's the word of God, naturally, look out for God, the name Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit. These keep repeating. And I want you to highlight these words, or if you're doing it on the computer, change the color of the fonts. Now, when I learned these things, I had to do it on paper. There were no computers then. Oh. And then, of course, there are people. And uh, you see... The author, if it's an epistle, the author is important. Highlight or change the color uh, of each word that uh, points to the author. There are recipients, use another color. And of course, other people. There might be Moses, David, uh, there might be certain wicked people. You know, just find out for yourself from your reading. Who are the different people there? And especially those that keep repeating. There are words that indicate time, words that indicate uh, places, there are words that indicate uh, uh, certain virtues, certain sins to be avoided, certain commands, certain promises. Keep asking these questions and you will discover it. Now, this is from a Bible study that I did recently. This is the prologue to the Gospel of John, the first 18 verses. And you find that I've highlighted these verses. I used different colors for different themes. I used the purple color for the Logos, the Word, and for God, God the Father, the only begotten. I used a brown highlighting for uh, words that point to John the Baptist and uh, uh, so many other things that are highlighted. So when, when you highlight your, uh, uh, you see, when you highlight the gospel, of, sorry, the epistle of Jude, this is what you will find. You will find your text highlighted. But then if you have already come up with your sentence diagram, this is how it will look like. Now, I'm not showing you my sentence diagram because I don't want you to miss that opportunity to create your own sentence diagram. So please don't be disappointed with that. I'm showing you the prologue here. This is the highlighting. And if you, make, if you combine the highlighting with the sentence diagram, this is how it will look like. And here, just look at this. The, the whole text moves. Uh, you know, towards the center, and then this is a reverse symmetry. And in the reverse symmetry, usually what's given in the middle is the most important thing. And here, the definition of the children of God, those who are born of God, that's the most important thing here. In the same way, you will discover things in the epistle of Jude. 
Okay, so gather more information and keep collecting information about the author. And in the first two verses, you will find that, for example, Jude is a bond servant of Jesus Christ. He's James's brother. He's the author of this epistle. And Jude greets his recipients. So what are you supposed to do with these things? You, there's a form given there in the workbook. I want you to collect all the information that you collect from the text and write it down. And these sections are the major subdivisions which you will discover for yourself. And you collect all the information that you get about Jude, about God, about Jesus, about uh, whoever else is there in that epistle. Keep filling it up and then you will be able to state the summary of each section and you will put together all these summaries to come up with the summary of the book. I've explained these things very well in the workbook. So uh, if, you're, if you really are into it, you will find enough information. This is what I just said now. This is how you derive the theme of the whole book. And there are more things to look for. You see, there are, there are figures of speech, uh, comparisons and contrasts, there are virtues, there are commands to be obeyed, there are promises uh, that we can hang on to, there are sins to avoid. Uh, there are references to the Apocrypha, references to other sources, prophecies, and there are types. Uh, maybe there are types. Uh, a type is, say, for example, Isaac on the altar uh, was, a, was an anti-type of Jesus Christ. That's what I mean by types. So you've got to keep your eyes open and you will discover so many things. So many things that keep repeating and anything that's repeated is very important. And finally, now I don't want you to see what actually I did with the English version of my study, but this is what I did with my Malayalam version of the inductive study of uh, Jude. And for this, I had to translate the epistle into my own version of Malayalam uh, so that I could create a sentence diagram. On the left side, you see the subdivisions of the text. You see how I've used different highlightings, different symbols, I've uh, indicated time and whatnot, all those things. And if you want to take a, uh, just a quick look at what finally I got at the end of the study in English, it looks like this. Uh, and uh, the things that I studied uh, many years ago, it's still fresh in my mind because this book went through me. It's not just me going through the book. And I have uh, the basic information about the, 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 the epistle of Jude at my fingertips at all times so here's the invitation be bold enough to launch out into a into a great exercise inductive study of jude download the uh, the workbook and here is the qr code to my um, youtube channel i hope you will go through that and uh, uh, go through the video lessons so back to you uh the mcs who are there and thank you so much for the Bible, inductive Bible study that you took right now.